Hello, everybody. Today we have Chris Doxy with us for our podcast, Case Studies in Procure-to-Pay Fraud. Chris spent most of her career implementing leading financial processes and internal controls at global companies such as Digital Equipment Corporation, Compact Computer Corporation, Hewlett Packard, and MCI, where she was a controller, director of financial process transformation, internal auditor, and director of global accounts payable. As president of Doxy Inc., she consults with several Fortune 100 companies and P2P solution providers. She supports the IOFM as a trainer and consultant. So, hello, Chris. Thanks a lot for doing this. Uh, so, let us start this podcast uh, with our first question, which is, so please tell us about the case studies that you have seen that have impacted the P2P process. Yes, hello, everyone. I'm glad to be here today with Zykus. And one of my favorite topics is talking about uh, P2P fraud and analyzing what went wrong. And um, talk about maybe three case studies uh, today. And one slide I like to put up when I talk about case studies is related to Sarbanes-Oxley 404. And we don't have to go through this you know, whole slide today, but one of the key things is when we think about what keeps a controller or a business process owner up at night, the questions are, well, what can go wrong in my process? And some of the case studies that, that we'll talk about uh, for a moment here uh, are, are definitely what went wrong, and someone at these companies um, definitely wasn't thinking about, okay, well, what, what happened here? And the first one is, is a pretty compelling uh, case, and it happened in a, a school system in the Washington, D.C. area. And what happened is the uh, individual had responsibility for a charter school system, and she was able to embezzle about $850,000 uh, over a period of maybe about five years. And what she did was uh, she was in charge of uh, procurement and accounts payable, and she was uh, able to set up um, basically phony suppliers, uh, phony contracts, and divert money to friends and family, get back um, uh, money for or kickbacks for uh, doing um, these contracts. And um, you know, she was actually a highly educated um, individual in the school system um, at the PhD level, which is uh, you know certainly um, unfortunate. But what happened was um, you know she was caught, and the uh, school system you know did not have the proper controls. And if I analyze this case, I would say you know a lack of segregation of duties, lack of delegation of authority no accounting reconciliations, and the fact that the individual, um, you know, maybe because of her uh, capabilities and, um, you know, her power in the organization was able to do these things. So she was able to pay back about half of the, of the um, embezzlement, and then the individuals that were part of the theft ring were also, um, you know, brought to, um, to trial as well. Uh, the second case I'll talk about is um, one that I actually investigated, and it happened at one of my prior companies, and it has to do with system access. And system access is, is one of the very critical controls, and we'll go back and we'll talk about the three critical controls in, in a moment, but system access is really critical to make sure that the right people don't have or have access to the, the proper transactions. And what happened in this case, the uh, company that, that I was working for was implementing a new ERP system. So a team of finance professionals uh, was involved in testing the new system and, and basically looking at the functionality from the transaction right through financial close. And that meant that there had to be visibility from the transaction to the general ledger. 
and that meant that um, special access uh, to see the transaction had to be granted. And that meant you had the capability to process transactions that others weren't supposed to do. So you could process transaction accounts payable, accounts receivable, right through the general ledger. When the system was implemented and the team was disbanded, uh, one individual um, realized she still had this access and she was able to embezzle about $300,000 and, um, uh, you know, again, to, uh, basically set up a vendor, pay a vendor, cover her tracks, buy a journal entry, and because the, the company was in such a disarray with a new system and everyone was in, you know, new roles and responsibilities, the company had just acquired another uh, entity. There was just so much going on. The reconciliations weren't being done in a timely manner that she was able to, um, you know, put this money aside. So when she was found, um, you know, she was able to pay it back and um, we put the controls in place to look at system access and system rights on a monthly basis. And that's why I'm really a, a stickler and I, I coach everyone I talk to look at system access and be very careful about um, uh, any changes to your organization and also you know, make sure that if you have implemented a new system and you have a special team doing testing, that their rights are reviewed when your system is fully implemented. Okay, so the last case study is the P card, uh, for procurement card fraud, and this individual um, was given a, a procurement card. He actually worked for a government um, agency out in, um, uh, actually on the west coast of the United States, and he used the credit card to buy all kinds of things, um, uh, basically um, home uh, improvement uh, material. He actually used the credit card to refurbish a, a, um, an automobile, and um, he actually was able to use company funds to pay the credit card. And, you know, again, total lack of segregation of duties, uh, total lack of delegation of authority, and certainly uh, PCOT administration was not even on the radar screen in this case. And I believe the total amount was about half a million dollars for this individual and he did not act alone, um, you know, in this case, and there were several individuals that were part of the fraud and they were all, you know, brought to, brought to prison. So the, the, um, the government was able to get back most of the money. And um, unfortunately in this case, um, the individual had pulled in his family to basically lie um, that, you know, these goods that he had basically brought home, it did, did not happen, that he used them in the office, and it was just a real mess, and just total lack of integrity and tone at the top and, you know, all kinds of things were just not in place for this individual. So we think about, okay, what went wrong with all these case studies, and we look at the controls that were not in place, the detect, the preventative controls were not there, any program controls, any system controls were not there, and um, very um, unfortunate. And anyone that would like to learn about, um, you know, case studies, um, uh, the FBI.gov website has some very interesting case studies. Unfortunately, um, fraudsters are still out there. There's, there's um, still a lot of um, fraud happening on a global basis. Uh, more uh, websites for you to check are the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the ACFE. They've also got a library of case studies, and um, it's just interesting to look at them, to analyze them, and see what you would have done to prevent and, and um, detect the fraud from actually occurring. Great question, and certainly something that um, I'd like to um, see fraudsters use their talent to um, do good things rather than bad things. Hey, thanks a lot, Chris, for that. So can you please tell us what are the key controls that were missing and do you see a common theme? 
Yeah, uh, so the key controls that were missing, you know, again, we, I mentioned I'd tell you more about the, the top three uh, critical corporate controls. And the top one is, is um, segregation of duties. And what fraudsters, you know, find, um, you know, again, if they're certainly working inside a company, which is where most fraud happens, it's by committed by employees, um, and sometimes there's collusion. And segregation of duties means that you want to prevent, um, uh, you know, other departments and other people from uh, processing a transaction that they shouldn't. And, and that's, you know, certainly with the cases of embezzlement that we talked about, um, somebody should have been signing off on those large expenditures. And segregation of duties ensures that the checks and balances are in place and the assets of a company are protected. And so that's the first key control. The second one is system access, and that was one of the case studies we talked about. And it goes kind of hand in hand with uh, segregation of duties. With system access, where everything is, is done um, on systems today, we want to make sure that the right people are using their capabilities correctly. And basically from a systems perspective, within accounts payable, the, no one can set up a vendor that can actually process a disbursement. That would be one example. That would be called um, a, a um, intra system access capability. And from an extra system access capability, that's ensuring that somebody in accounts receivable cannot process a, a, um, a transaction in accounts payable. When I was uh, in uh, the WorldCom, uh, you know, I call it the cleanup crew, we found many violations of, of system access rules where we found uh, accounts receivable people uh, being able to process accounts payable transactions doesn't say that they were, but the fact is that the risk was there because they had the capability. And the third one is delegation of authority. And delegation of authority is basically a policy and procedure which sets the levels of authority um, or signature sign-offs for a company commitment or expenditure. And in a nutshell, it basically says that if you're a certain level in your company that you have the authority to sign off on an established level. And what it looks like is basically a big matrix that says, okay, up to, um, you know, maybe uh, $20,000, um, a manager can sign off on this. And anything higher requires, you know, director, VP, and the best way to implement a delegation of authority process is to tie it to a job uh, level. So if you're level, um, you know, one, two, three, as a manager, you have all these levels associated with it, and then your levels are tied to a, 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 um, a matrix within a system, and workflow is tied right to that. So you don't have manual paper and checks and balances, so for invoices and POs, everything is um, totally automated. So those are the three critical controls, and basically going back to my days at um, you know, WorldCom, which became MCI, we had to rebuild the company, establish these controls, and we did the, the um, delegation of authority process in um, Ariba, tied it to the employee master, and used SAP for many of the other controls that, that uh, we're talking about. So if you have those controls in place, um, you've pretty much, I don't want to say you're guaranteed, but if you've got those in place and you're, you're looking at them on a regular basis and then you build other control activities around the P2P process, you'll, you'll be in pretty good shape. And then you look for the symptoms of fraud um, and, you know, pay attention to your your day-to-day, -day, um, there's a good chance that a fraudster will think twice before committing a fraud because fraudsters usually know if controls are weak or lacking and they'll take advantage of the situation. So Chris, do most fraudsters act alone or in groups? 
Yeah, and, and you know, going back to our three case studies, and, and I picked those three um, because we saw, you know, two with the the um, the lady from the school system. You know, she was working in a group, and you know, again with friends and family, and then you know, uh, the P card individual um, was working with with groups, and then the individual that that um, took advantage of her system access capabilities was working individually, and. You know, typically, um, you know, it, it, it's kind of a mix. I, I've seen really both, but I have seen, you know, cases of of um, individuals that realize, oh boy, I've got all this, you know, um, access to either to a system or there's no uh, segregation of duties, and I, I can, you know, do all these things. And and um, uh, you know, I think the larger frauds that that we talked about. Um, you know, where you're looking at a half a million to a million dollars, those are usually um, uh, perpetrated by groups of fraudsters. But I think the smaller ones are, are um, you know, committed by um, by um, individuals. And, and then sometimes what happens, unfortunately, is the behavior of a fraudster is, is sometimes, you know, leads to bring in others. And I'll just mention um, a couple other case studies I ran into uh, one um, other uh, unfortunate situation where an individual was setting up garnishment um, vendors um, erroneously in the supplier master. And these were, um, you know, again, uh, acquaintances and, and um, people that she knew that, you know, again, were, were providing her with kickbacks. And that indicates, well, she was setting everything up, but she was getting kickbacks from these erroneous um, individuals. And um, that, you know, indicated a whole bunch of controls that needed to happen in the, the vendor master. That's why that's another area I really, you know, focus on for fraud prevention. The second case study uh, I'll mention is within a small um, legal office, uh, an individual had access to pretty much all the the books and all the financial transactions. So she was able to um, steal uh, client payments um, and hide, um, you know, those those payments. Uh, so hide receivables, hide payables, and um, actually uh, pay herself through payroll. And over a period of time, um, she was able to I think walk away with about 150,000, and the garnishment lady I mentioned. Um, I think she walked away with about 300. So a lot of the frauds are between 150 and 300,000, and I, like I said, the bigger ones, um, you know, that go undetected for a period of time, um, do tend to involve more people. So that that's a great question uh, to ask. So, Chris, why are corporate fraudsters usually long-time employees of a company? Yeah, another good question. And that, that's that, that's because they they're, they know where the secrets are buried. Um, they know where there are internal control weaknesses, and they know you know if a new system has been implemented. Uh, they know if there's a change in management. They also know if there is an internal control issue that has been, you know, undetected, and they may, in fact, you know, be a, a high-level individual that um, may be asking, you know, their staff to hide, um, you know, hide a problem. And you know, going back to some of the, you know, biggest frauds in history with, you know, again, WorldCom and, and Enron. Um, Scott Sullivan, the CFO at um, at um, uh, WorldCom, asked people to you know to make, uh, knowingly um, make accounting errors, and what you know again to hide you know the the actual condition financial condition of the company, they were doing um, uh, erroneous financial entries to. A book expenses as revenue, and that that's really you know the biggest the biggest fraud. But the bad behavior you know had to do with um, processing uh, very large um, travel and expense, uh, travel and entertainment expenses, 
and just the you know again tone at the top and you know very bad um, uh, lack of corporate governance uh, throughout the company and what happens is um, you know employees sometimes think uh, oh it's okay to do this and one thing I'll talk about is with the triangle of fraud or the fraud triangle the three components are uh, justification so an employee may say, oh, okay, I've been here, you know, for 10 years. Um, I haven't gotten a raise in two years, so it's okay for me to divert this money um, to my bank account. And then there's um, the need. They may come into a financial difficulty where they've got, um, you know, some sort of, uh, you know, health uh, situation or, um, you know, there's a spouse that's been laid off or the need could be perceived that they need to keep up with, you know, uh, um, their, uh, you know, um, neighbors or something like that. So they, they divert money or, you know, come up with, you know, um, stealing checks or colluding with suppliers or that kind of thing. And then the other part, uh, the final part of the triangle is the opportunity. And the opportunity is that they have the opportunity um, and maybe the knowledge to uh, commit the fraud because they know they know the system. They've been um, a long time employee. They know you know what's going on in the P2P process, and they're able to divert the funds. And um, there's also something called the fraud diamond, and it has four components. The the three that we already talked about. And the fourth component is the capability, and that means that they're almost um, a system hacker uh, or an expert, and they're able to, you know, go in and, and hide their tracks and, you know, commit, uh, you know, phony entries and things like that. And that's why, you know, system access and reviews are so critical with what, you know, we talked about. So three or two key components to think about. Um, uh, when you're, you know, really delving into, you know, case study review and, and um, fraud uh, uh, analysis and the way a fraudster thinks, uh, the fraud diamond and the fraud triangle are, are good things to, to know. All right. So, Chris, what single process should have the strongest controls within the P2P process and why? Okay, so within the P2P process, I, I look at um, really disbursements and, you know, making sure you've got positive pay, uh, positive payee, you've got uh, someone signing off on large disbursements, uh, wires, and ensuring that someone is reviewing, um, you know, certainly for duplicate uh, payments and, you um, and, and that would be certainly covered, you know, by a self-audit tool. Um, we talked about that in one of our previous uh, podcasts. But I, I think with disbursements, what helps control disbursements quite a bit or payments is, is really um, having an automated uh, payment process or paying by, um, you know, by e-payment and ACH um, and, um, you know, ensuring our electronic payment, you know, certainly globally. And that's to make sure that you're not uh, having the opportunity for somebody to divert a, a check and, um, you know, make sure that um, those checks aren't getting into the wrong hands. And unfortunately in the U.S. we, we still pay with checks and um, it, it's, you know, something that hopefully will go away someday. But, but basically even if the payments are made electronically, you still have to have a set of controls and, and that's to review uh, payment files, um, you know, make sure there's the segregation of duties that we talked about earlier. So whenever there's a payment run that someone reviews that, um, there's some sort of audit uh, check and balance. And certainly large payments um, are, are reviewed like I talked about. That's going to be dependent upon the size of your company. And international wires are reviewed to make sure that they're going to the proper party and there are additional compliance controls for wires, and what we look at are anti-money laundering controls and also um, compliance controls to make sure particularly that 
the wires and payments aren't going to enemies of the United States um, as designated by the Office of Foreign Asset Control. So, Chris, why is continuous controls monitoring so important to all companies? Yeah, there, there are four levels of continuous controls monitoring, and this is um, a, a good way to kind of pull in um, a lot of the things we've already talked about. And continuous controls monitoring includes user access controls and not just looking at your system access uh, on a periodic basis, but making sure you're, you're reviewing that on a regular basis and doing remediation. And what continuous controls monitoring does, it's not just, okay, I'm, I'm taking a quick peek at my controls. I'm actually reviewing and remediating. And, you know, I gotta tell you, you know, working with controls as long as I have, um, one of the biggest challenges, you know, there's there are so many controls that people uh, identify that need to be reviewed and they never get, you know, remediated. And part of the, the issue is what are the top things that that are, are, um, are, are the biggest risk and what do I need to remediate? The other component of CCM or continuous controls monitoring is business transaction monitoring. And that's really looking at some of the things we mentioned um, in our case studies. How do you review those transactions that could end up being a fraud and um, maybe getting some alerts? And what are the triggers, what are the pain points that could indicate that maybe a fraud is, is uh, imminent. And then the master data and static data controls monitoring, and those are really looking at your vendor master and ensuring that the right vendors are, in, are um, you know, being set up and that people aren't setting up phony vendors, they're not um, uh, purging vendors, um, and they're actually paying attention to the vendor master file. And one thing I'll mention there in the spirit of continuous controls monitoring is many companies review their supplier master and compare that against their employee master on a regular basis and ensure that the employees um, aren't, their employees aren't posing as a supplier. And they don't just do a, you know, a, a you know, kind of a surface um, review what they do is, is actually look at, um, of course, name, uh, tax identification number, or EIN number, VAT number. They look at address. Um, they also look at bank account number. And there have been cases where employees and accounts payable, or P2P, have changed their uh, bank account numbers to a supplier bank account number. And, you know, again, I don't make this stuff up. This does actually happen. And last but not least, from a system perspective, and, you know, we are so driven by systems uh, today, we want to make sure that IT and certainly with um, looking at all our automation solutions, we want to make sure that our systems are set up properly with uh, the right controls in place so that we have a closed loop um, continuous controls monitoring process with the four levels that we talked about. All right, so thanks a lot, Chris, for this very informative, se informative session on procure to pay fraud case studies. I hope our listeners had a great time learning about this. Thanks again, Chris, for doing this, and goodbye, everyone. Thank you, and bye, everyone.